Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tierra Howard with ICF, and welcome to the Office of Housing Counseling and the Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunities second webinar in the Combating Appraisal Bias series titled, What Housing Counselors Need to Know. Before we begin, let's review a few technical logistics. All participants are in listen-only mode. Please submit all technical related questions and issues via the chat box and make sure that you send your message to the host. We also encourage you to ask questions throughout this webinar and you can enter your content related questions at any time in the Q&A box and make sure that you select host, presenter and panelist. Please note that due to time constraints, we may not be able to answer everyone's question today. This webinar is scheduled for one hour and 30 minutes. It is being recorded. The PowerPoint has been posted for this session and we will provide the link in the chat box so you can access, access the materials there. The recording and the transcript will be made available on the series website on the HUD Exchange along with the resources that supplement today's conversation. For housing counseling agencies who have joined, webinar attendance will be marked following the live webinar, and you'll be able to print your certificate by next week. To kick off the webinar, we first like to ask a few poll questions. So pull out your, your smartphones or your computer, um, and you'll want to go to www.menti.com. Um, using your computer or smartphone, and they're going to want to type this, the uh, code that you see here on the screen. You can also click on the link that we dropped into the chat box to get directly to Mentimeter if you don't want to type out the, the URL. So we're going to give folks a few seconds to join. And once you've joined, just make sure you click that heart that you see on the screen at the bottom right corner of your screen so I can make sure that everyone's here and ready to answer all of the questions that we have for you. And I'll just give it a few more seconds as we wait for folks to join. Once again, click that link in the chat box to get directly to the poll questions. Okay. So our first, first poll question, what do you hope to learn from today's session? Do you wanna learn more about PAVE and the PAVE Action Plan? Do you wanna learn more about the impact of the action plan specifically for housing counseling agencies? Do you wanna learn more about how to identify appraisal bias and what it looks like? Or do you wanna learn more about how your agency can support clients who have been impacted by appraisal bias? Let us know uh, why you're here today. What are you hoping to learn? And once again, I'll repeat, if you need to get to the poll questions, all you need to do is uh, click on the di direct link that William Moore entered into the chat box. Okay, so as results are rolling in, it looks like a lot of folks are interested in learning more about how to identify appraisal bias and what it looks like. And then in second place, um, folks really want to know how they can take this information back to their agency to support clients who have been impacted by appraisal bias. And then in third place, more folks want to learn more about PAVE and the action plan. And that's awesome because we have Melody here today to tell you more about PAVE, the action plan, and then Jerry will get into uh, the implications for housing counseling agencies. So that's great that you're here um, and joining us today. Our next question is, please share your familiarity with PAVE. How familiar, familiar are you with PAVE? Are you very, very familiar, not familiar, somewhat familiar? just so we can understand who's out there in the audience. Um, so it looks like a lot of folks are not familiar with PAVE and that's awesome. Once again, Melody will be sharing more about PAVE and some of those uh, commitments that HUD is making to combat appraisal bias along with Fair Housing Partners. And then the last question, please share your familiarity with PAVE's action plan. Do you, uh, are you very familiar with PAVE's action plan? You know the steps for housing counseling agencies. Are you somewhat familiar and eager to learn more? Or are you not very familiar and you're interested in learning more? And that's why you're here today. So it looks like most folks are here because they wanna learn more. They're not very familiar with PAVE and you're at the right place. So now I am going to turn it over to my colleague, Karen Hoskins. Karen is a housing counseling uh, specialist with um, 
ICF and she was the former Karen, you were the former program manager for IC, uh, for housing counseling. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but you'll be she'll be here today uh, introducing herself and then sharing the, the learning objectives, providing an overview of what we'll be talking about today and she'll get into more details. Karen, I'm handing it over to you. Okay, great. Thank you, Tierra, and welcome to all of you. As Tierra said, I have an extensive background in uh, housing counseling and helping and assisting housing counseling agencies support the clients that they serve. So welcome, and thanks for being a part of this very important conversation about appraisal bias and what housing counselors and their agencies need to know in order to provide support to clients and consumers. But before we begin, let's, let's review the learning objectives for this session. Today, you will learn about appraisal bias and home valuations. You will also learn about the actions outlined in the PAVE Action Plan, which federal agencies have collaborated on and made commitments to root out appraisal bias. In addition, there will be recommendations and best practices for counseling clients and individuals who have been impacted by appraisal bias. Finally, we will share some of the available resources which can support housing counselors and their clients. As part of today's agenda, we will review some of the lessons learned from the Generational Wealth Gap Roundtable, which was the first webinar uh, in this three-part series. There will also be a review of the PAVE Action Plan. You will hear from two uh, housing counseling agencies sharing their experience with appraisal bias, Neighborhood Housing Services of Chicago and Fair Housing Advocates of Northern California, which is a housing counseling agency, but they also are a Fair Housing Initiative Program or FIP. We will gain insights uh, from an appraiser's perspective. We will also save time at the end for Q&A. And before we end the session today, we will share some of the resources available for you to access. Our presenters today are Ayako Marsh Miranda. She's a certified appraiser and a subcontractor to ICF. Jerry Mayer is the director of the Office of Housing Counseling at HUD. Melody Taylor is the Associate Deputy Assistant Secretary for Enforcement Compliance in the Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity, also at HUD. Julia Howard Gibbon is a supervising attorney uh, with the Fair Housing Advocates of Northern California. Fallon Young is a housing policy associate associate with the Neighborhood Housing Services of Chicago. And Michael Abanez is a senior homeownership counselor also with NHS of Chicago. So now I'd like to invite uh, Ayako Marsh uh, to join me. Uh, Ayako is one of a few African-American appraisers in this country and an even smaller group of female black appraisers. Uh, those of you who participated in the round table on appraisal bias and generational wealth will, will remember that Ayako uh, was a moderator for that webinar. She has over 22 years of residential appraisal experience working in Maryland and the surrounding region. And Ayako is also the president of a residential consulting firm specializing in appraisal bias, diversity, equity, and inclusion as well as appraisal appeal and litigation support. So welcome Ayako. Oh, thank you so much, Karen. I'm happy to be here. Great. So before we move on with the conversation today, why don't we take a look back at, the, at some of the key takeaways from the round table session, Ayako? Yes, yeah, so as, as we look back on that session, um, we found the, the Mentimeter poll tells us that although actually lived experience is limited, there was about 33% or one or three of the uh, participants in the last round table that have clients or extended family or personal experience with appraisal bias. And we also heard from several organizations that shared with us the impact of appraisal bias on generational wealth and how a generational wealth contributes to the financial stability of families, helps ensures further generations to have resources to build upon 
and also supports the creation of thriving communities. We had two personal stories of appraisal bias, one from Chicago and one from Prince George's County, Maryland. And we also heard from two housing counseling agencies that are actively combat combating appraisal bias, the Neighborhood Housing Services of Chicago and the Spanish Coalition for Housing. And finally, we heard from the National Association of Realtors that provided some of the history and what changes they're considering to address appraisal bias. So it was a lot of information that we heard and a lot of takeaways from the last round table. And I left that round table thinking, I know we've heard a lot in the real estate arena that the word is always location, location, location. And when I think about appraisal bias, I think it's really about education, education, education. The more educated we are about the appraisal process, what appraisal bias looks like is actually gonna help us to really combat appraisal bias. So that was the, the main takeaways we learned from the last round table. Okay, and there was also a call to action which encouraged housing counseling agencies to explore where education on appraisal bias can be included in homeownership counseling and education programs. Uh, and if you hadn't already done so, we encourage, still encourage to engage with fair housing agencies in your service delivery area and explore ways to partner with them. Uh, continue this conversation and join us for the other webinars in the series. Of course, this is webinar two, which will be followed by a third session later in March, which we will let you know more about before we close today. And to come back and join these sessions for specific resources and tools housing counseling agencies can use to help identify bias. So let's move forward with our agenda to help agencies better understand the home appraisal process and where in that process bias might be a concern, a special infographic tool has been created, which Ayako will walk us through. Ayako? Okay, so this infographic was based on the results of recent appraisal bias studies and reports, as well as recent appraisal claims. I'm really glad to hear that in the Mentimeter poll that a lot of us today want to learn more about how to identify appraisal bias in the appraisal process and in the appraisal report. Now this infographic is of course not exhaustive of, area, of every area, but it's just to highlight a few so that we can immediately go, go back and help homeowners to identify appraisal bias areas in the report. And it's really about asking questions on each of, each of these areas to see where does it kind of fall in line compared to what you're seeing in the actual report. The first section is neighborhood. Has the neighborhood description been defined ac accurately? For a lot of the reports that are happening in the media, we hear about appraisal bias. A homeowner lives in a particular neighborhood, but they're finding that all of the comparables are not necessarily coming from that neighborhood. And there may be a valid reason for that, but it needs to be explained in the report. The second one is subject property condition. Do the comparable sales and the subject property relate in terms of condition? Are the comparable sales similar to the subject property when it relates to condition? And if they aren't, there has to be an adequate adjustment. Is the adjustment too high at the upper range or is it too low? It's really deciding and really trying to decipher, are the comparables really related to the subject and what the true condition of the subject property is? And also related is the actual search for comparable sales. And when we go back and look again at the neighborhood, are these comparable sales or at least some of the comparable sales selected from the defined neighborhood? So you have this defined neighborhood that is defined on the first page in the appraisal report. Are these comparables from the neighborhood? Are they bunched together in one area? Are they spread apart? Is there a reason why one area is used of that neighborhood and not another? We need to kind of figure out why some cells are not used. And if they aren't, there needs to be some comment or explanation in the report regarding that. The next item are individual adjustments. Are the individual adjustments supported using market data? It's very common term in appraisal reports 
that you know, based on my years of experience, the just adjustment is ABC. And we need to have data to support that. Now, we're not asking that it be a full report of how all the data was calculated, but at least a summary of where did the data come from and how did you arrive at the adjustment? So we know where the individual, individual adjustments are derived. The next area is reconciliation and are the cells reconciled at the lower range? The Freddie Mac study found that in brown and black neighborhoods, that there's a tendency to reconcile the adjusted sale prices at the low range for black and brown neighborhoods. And for white neighborhoods, the adjusted sale prices are reconciled at the upper range. So kind of take a look and see, is there a pattern of it always being reconciled at the lower range? Finally, we look at the appraisal comments. Do the comments imply or reflect bias or is there any language in the report regarding race or ethnicity or nationality? There are some of the recent studies that have shown that there have been very blatant language in the appraisal report regarding race. And so we kind of need to take a look at that. When you look at this infographic, you want to ask the questions. If the answer is yes to any of these questions, then you may want to request a reconsideration of value based on these questions and your answers to the questions. I hope this information has been helpful to our audience today to better understand the appraisal process and the areas that should be evaluated and determine if appraisal bias has occurred. Thanks, Ayako, for that overview of the appraisal process. And Ayako will be joining us again later in the agenda to talk more about some of her work on appraisal bias and share some of her own experiences. Um, so now it's my pleasure to introduce Jerry Mayer, the director of the HUD Office of Housing Counseling. Jerry? Well, thank you, Karen, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jerry Mayer, and I'm here for David Barenbaum, who is our Deputy Assistant Secretary for HUD's Office of Housing Counseling. Unfortunately, David is unable to be with us today because he's been called away to participate in an event with FHA Commissioner Gordon. Uh, next slide, please. So welcome to all the HUD certified housing counselors and others who have joined us for combating appraisal bias, what counselors need to know. Appraisal bias is a homeownership and a civil rights issue that affects consumers and communities nationwide. I started my career at HUD 38 years ago as an appraiser with FHA, and I saw firsthand how bias in appraisals hurts families, inhibits the passing of generational wealth to our children and prevents the full realization of the American dream. Inequity divides us. It reduces investment in communities of color and gives purchase to poverty. Every day, HUD certified housing counselors help consumers confront housing challenges, including fundamental fairness issues like appraisal bias. Counselors can help clients understand what appraisal bias is, how it affects them, and most importantly, how to do something about it. I want to thank HUD's Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity for their help in bringing this important issue to the housing counseling community. And I encourage you to visit the National Fair Housing Training Academy to continue your studies. Together, we can train housing counselors so that they can help consumers meet any housing challenge. And now I'd like to introduce Melody Taylor. She is the Associate Deputy Assistant Secretary for Enforcement Compliance in HUD's Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity. She is also HUD's Senior PAVE Advisor. Melody has worked on fair housing and civil rights issues by providing education, enforcement, and advocacy for more than 20 years. So without further ado, I'll hand the mic over to Melody. Thanks, Jerry, and thanks everyone for having me. Um, just wanna, I was a little concerned when we started the polling because uh, when PAVE ran a, 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 the a third in terms of interest, I thought, am I here to give good information? Are people gonna receive this? So I'm glad that in the other two questions, uh, folks were more interested and wanted to know more about PAVE and you didn't have any familiarity with it. So let me just give you a quick overview. Um, PAVE was endorsed by the vice president and launched in March of 2022. And the action plan represents the most wide ranging set of reforms ever put forward 
to advance equity in the home appraisal process. The task force is made up of 13 federal and independent agencies uh, chaired by Secretary Marsha Fudge uh, that you saw in the previous slide and Domestic Policy Council um, Ambassador Rice. The task force was intended to evaluate the cause, extent, and consequences of appraisal bias. Uh, and the action plan does represent just that. Um, when uh, Ayako spoke earlier about education, 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 it's critically important. And as housing counselors, you have a really critical role in educating consumers. What we were made acutely aware of uh, when starting this task force was that consumers um, were disconnected from information and understanding where, where and how appraisals affected, not just the individual, but the actual community in which they lived in. And so the action plan um, took into consideration the historical aspects of appraisal bias in the home purchase and refinance markets. Um, so we had a narrow focus there. Uh, we also looked at the lack of diversity and access to the industry, um, as you heard earlier. We also uh, took a deep dive look at the call for data and why data is necessary and needed to evaluate appraisal bias, governance, compliance, and enforcement. Uh, with regards to the impact of appraisal bias, I wanted to just talk a little bit about uh, some of what we saw. Again, uh, Ayako mentioned the uh, uh, data uh, with regards to Freddie Mac's study, but at the top of this initiative, uh, there was substantial pushback from the housing industry that uh, the data didn't show discrimination. Um, and we know that anecdotally, um, and you'll hear from some uh, of the other uh, partners on this call talk about um, how appraisal bias impacted um, individuals and cases. Uh, but with the help of Freddie and Fannie and Federal Housing Finance Agency data that was released, um, we were made acutely aware that the impact of appraisal bias is longstanding. It limits an individual and the community's opportunity to gain wealth and impedes the transference of wealth. And as noted in Freddie Mac's study, eliminating racial home ownership disparities would shrink the wealth gap between black and white households by 31% and Latino and white households by 28% respectively. Additional data uh, provided that undervaluations create financial harm to home buyers of color in entire communities, um, thus reducing the value of the homes uh, in a community which has a, a, a disparate impact on the ability for the community to gain wealth, the amenities in the community, um, and has a marginalized effect on a community as well. And then lastly, data showed that the appraisal workforce lacked diversity and the credentialing requirements reduced the opportunity to access the profession. Overarchingly, the cumulative impact of these disparities in home appraisals can be sweeping. It limits homeowners' ability to fully benefit from refinancing or reselling their homes at higher valuations and thereby contributing to the growing racial wealth gap. You could flip to the next slide. Great. Um, so I just want to talk a little about how we arrived at this information. So it was not done in a vacuum at all. Um, the PAVE Action Plan continues to catalyze industry dialogue it's fostered partnerships that we haven't seen before, and it is a roadmap for change. We listened, held critical discussions to help prioritize key issues and themes. And it's also important to note that this process was inclusive and intentional to bring about a diverse set of stakeholders and views to validate the action items that were born in the plan. Uh, so we held listening sessions and stakeholder engagements that included a, a vast and a variety of stakeholders, appraisers, um, NAR, lenders, uh, depositories and non-depositories, advocacy, researchers, and philanthropy. Next slide. Um, so based on, on uh, you know, synthesizing data, conversations, roundtable discussions, we were able to target several key themes uh, in the report. So making the appraisal industry more accountable um, the notion that uh, there is a, it's, it's a loosely regulated industry and a lack of governance. And so one of the initiatives is to create um, more expansive governance and legislation around 
uh, the Appraisal Foundation's uh, operations. Empowering consumers with information and assistance. Um, a huge part of the action plan and what you'll hear from Jerry later on is that uh, there's a commitment for us to work with housing counselors, thousands of housing counselors across the country to ensure that we're educating consumers. Uh, you have a critical role in that process. Ensuring that technology-based alternatives to human appraisals do not perpetuate bias. And so uh, there's a, a portion of the report that focuses on um, algorithmic bias and automated valuation models and whether or not the information baked into those systems can represent bias and data in the process. Cultivating an appraiser profession that is well-trained and looks like the communities that it serves. Um, again, at the top of the hour, I, I think our, our, our host talked a bit about Ayako being um, one of few women and women of color who represent the industry. And we've seen that time and time again um, throughout the, the report and some of the anecdotal accounts that we've heard from, from other stakeholders. Coordinating enforcement to keep industry accountable is uh, one of the major responsibilities of the Office of Fair Housing Equal Opportunity, but also some of our partner agencies, the Department of Justice, uh, Consumer Federal uh, Protection Agency, uh, FHFA, and others who have a responsibility for enforcement and compliance. And then lastly, leveraging federal data and expertise to inform policy practice and research. Um, I can't speak highly enough of the, the need for data um, or the call for data, I will say, um, and the, the task force members response in creating data and the release of data, which has shown to be critically important uh, in continuing to document the disparities in appraisal bias. Flip to the next slide. Uh, so part of uh, what I wanted to share also is that we, we were, during the development of, of the PAVE Action Plan, there were uh, many early wins and accomplishments that we were able to achieve. And just to name a few, um, you know, in, in the case of the Austins in California, DOJ issued a statement of interest, which clarified that appraisers can be held liable under the um, fair housing laws and establishes federal government's commitment to combating appraisal bias. Um, I think relevant uh, around governance is that the appraisal subcommittee released an independent review of appraisal standards and appraisal qualification criteria when we talk about access to the industry and the impact thereof. Uh, and lastly, I'll just highlight the FHA um, issued a mortgagee letter to clarify non-discrimination requirements applicable to appraisers and lenders, including the Fair Housing Act and anti-discrimination laws at both local, state, and federal levels. Slide. So I wanna share just a bit about where we were uh, launch. We are well, well beyond launch and into implementation. Uh, we, we, in fact, uh, have an anniversary date coming up next month. And uh, there have been a, a number of continuous wins and movement to transform the industry. Uh, and just to name a few of those things, uh, you know, the appraisal subcommittee provided the state of Mississippi with funds to launch a nine-month appraiser, tr appraiser training program and graduate a class of diverse appraisers. Uh, these grant funds uh, are, are also being used in South Dakota uh, and can be obtained by other states around the country. So those funds are available. Most recently in um, October of 22, uh, Federal Housing Finance Agency publicly made available 44 million appraisal records. Um, and it's, this answered the call from industry researchers and civil rights advocates to combat bias through transparency and is a large step towards fulfilling the PAVE commitment. I will tell you that uh, immediately once the data was released, um, there were several researchers that uh, grabbed the data and began to uh, evaluate and analyze and, and you know, thereafter produced reports uh, that, again, continues to show the disparities in the industry. Uh, HUD in January also, as a follow-up, issued a, another mortgagee letter for industry comment, um, and this uh, proposed policy changes to strengthen FHA requirements for uh, processing and documenting reconsideration of value requests. And then lastly, I'll, I'll just say that in January, 
uh, the secretary and Ambassador Rice issued a letter to the Appraisal Foundation expressly requesting that TAP address barriers to entry. As we've mentioned, um, you know, there are communities such as Mississippi who did not have appraisers in certain counties there. Um, and you, you probably have heard and will continue to hear that the industry uh, lacks diversity in a great way. Uh, and numbers such as 97% of the industry um, is majorly white and male dominated and access to the industry continues to be limited. Um, and part of what the PAVE Action Plan does is uh, take into account those particular issues and those and agencies that are a part of the uh, task force are working to combat those particular barriers. I'm gonna stop there and turn this over to Jerry to talk more specifically around the action plan commitments that support the housing counseling efforts. And just wanna thank everyone for inviting me here today and being able to share information around the PAVE action plan. Well, thank you, Melody. And, and uh, the slide on the screen uh, focuses on our shared commitment to supporting the PAVE action plan and highlights the milestones on our journey to educate housing counselors and consumers. Uh, appraisal bias will be an area of study for future HUD certification exams, and we hope will be included in modernized national industry standards for home buyer education and counseling. Um, so Melody, before we continue with our training, I, I have two questions for you. First, how can housing counselors raise the issue of appraisal bias up on a local level? And second, what federal data can we look forward to? Sure. Thank you, Jerry. What a great question. Uh, and we have a great audience uh, to provide this information to. So as I mentioned during my presentation, I fully believe that housing counselors play a critical role in educating and increasing awareness for first-time homebuyers, uh, for transitioning renters, uh, and even existing homeowners, right? So uh, housing counselors are working in tandem with people who are in foreclosure, et cetera. So critical um, they play a critical role in educating and increasing awareness. Uh, but there are also opportunities to educate consumers and provide a roadmap to understanding the importance of an accurate appraisal. Um, so coaching clients and uh, the infograph that we had um, at the top of the hour, right, provides a very uh, simplified plain language education for consumers. So using those tools and resources that have been made available here in this webinar, um, on our pave.hud.gov website, um, just a host of information there. Also partnering with local appraisers to conduct workshops for consumers, right? Uh, again, we have, have an appraiser on, on the call uh, or in this webinar, um, but also localizing that effort, right? So working in tandem and partnering with appraisers in the communities. The better an appraiser knows the community and the people that it serves, I think you're gonna get greater opportunities for accurate valuation of property. And then lastly, uh, participating in local efforts. Uh, in the state of Maryland, uh, they've established a task force. City of Philadelphia has established a tax task force and having housing counselors participate in understanding the uh, context in which people are experiencing these issues is, is a, um, I think a very critical, op uh, critical um, moment for, for uh, housing counselors to participate uh, in, in those particular um, task force efforts. And then lastly, I will say, just because I am a, a fair housing um, a person here, is partnering with our local fair housing initiative program agencies. I know that a number of you probably already do, uh, but again, uh, fair housing initiative program agencies, uh, this fiscal year, there was about $28 million in funds to uh, allow FIP agencies to focus on uh, appraisal testing and education and outreach. And so the opportunity to partner, to educate, uh, to participate and understand their testing efforts, I think again, is a, is a great opportunity to, to assist uh, home buyers and, and to help housing counselors to educate the community. Um, and I'll jump to the, the issue of data. And again, as I mentioned early on, um, I have a friend who says, he, he likes to, when he starts a presentation, he says, data is your friend. Um, and it, it truly is in, 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 in this moment, in this opportunity to um, educate the public about 
uh, the experiences, the lived experiences relating to appraisal bias. Again, as I mentioned, there were many who didn't believe that this was even an issue, right? Um, and so over the last several months, key agencies have worked to develop a framework for federal shared appraisal database, which will uh, create transparency, um, make available public appraisal data sets to improve fair lending enforcement, uh, appraisal oversight, policy making, uh, safety and soundness and monitoring. Um, so meaningful opportunities to foster uh, greater access to, to research and providing tools to the public, um, but also to industry as well to help support uh, this effort and this movement to transform the industry. So I'll stop there and I'll turn it back over to you, Jerry. Well, thank you, Melody. And, and now we'll hand the mic uh, over to Karen, who will take us through the rest of today's training. Thank you, Jerry and Melody, for those remarks and for helping everyone better understand the elements of the PAVE Action Plan. Uh, there's a growing number of consumer stories where appraisal bias is apparent, and it's concerning the long-term impact it's having on generational wealth building. Listen and watch Carla Duffy's story. She's a homeowner in Indianapolis with her own personal story of how appraisal bias impacted her life. Homeownership is a big part of the American dream. There is a line in, oh brother, where art thou? where uh, one of the characters says, you're no kind of man if you don't own land. Having ownership is empowering. That's Carlette Duffy. She made headlines last year after revealing what happened to her home appraisal after hiding her race. Saddened and just depressed because it's like, here it is, there's the evidence of it. <sighs> You're bringing down the value of your home. Duffy said the value jumped from 125,000 to 259,000 when she whitewashed her home. It's a phrase used to describe what homeowners do to hide the race. I figured it would come back higher, but more than double. Duffy put her pet's ashes front and center because it sounded like something a white family might do, hid certain books, and took down African-looking art. The toughest part, tucking away pictures of her and her daughter. You're selling out. You're selling yourself, you know, just to advance. Duffy also asked a white friend to stand in for the appraisal that came back higher. When Carlette's story was very active in the news last year, we received a number of calls from not only in Indianapolis, but across the country. Amy Nelson with the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana said at first, there were only narratives attached to these theories. Now, studies show it's happening. New research by Freddie Mac found that more than one in 10 home appraisals in black and Latino neighborhoods resulted in a value below contract price or what someone was willing to pay. In white neighborhoods, it happens less often. To try and fight the bias, the White House task force wants to diversify the group of people who appraise homes, provide accessible data to better value homes, and give consumers more power to fight back if they don't think the appraisal is correct. The appraisal industry has admitted um, that very few requests for reconsideration are successful. Changes that Duffy welcomes so that no one has to go through what she did. Now, if this has happened to you, you can find out how to file a complaint at WTHR.com. So Carla Duffy is one of many homeowners and home buyers in black and brown communities who have experienced the undervaluation of their properties due to evidence of bias in the appraisal process. So let's move on. Just a quick reminder to everyone, if you have a question, you can post it to the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. Now I'd like to introduce, uh, reintroduce Fallon Young and Michael Urbanis from Neighborhood Housing Services of Chicago to join us to talk about their experience with appraisal bias and how they are supporting clients as well as working with other agencies on this issue. Uh, Fallon and Michael. Thank you, Karen, and good afternoon, everyone. 
Um, it's a pleasure to be here. So Neighborhood Housing Services of Chicago is the largest homeownership organization in the Chicago region, providing homeownership and financial education, foreclosure prevention, and lending. We are a community development financial institution, also known as, as a CDFI. We also engage in affordable home development and provide community engagement services for low and moderate income families and neighborhoods across Chicago's communities of color. We started over 47 years ago to counteract redlining, which informs the policy work that we do today to address barriers to home ownership, one of which being appraisal bias and discrimination. Our efforts focus on reforming the appraisal process by increasing consumer protections with state and regulatory agencies to address appraisal complaints and raising awareness about appraisal bias and empowering consumers to know their rights entering the appraisal process. And I'll turn it over to Michael Ibanez, our housing counselor, to give an overview of our counseling work. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Michael with NHS of Chicago, and I've been teaching homebuyer education doing a lot with pre-purchase education. And I just want to speak to the gravity of how much more depth there is in the appraisal process than we as counselors initially take on in our training, in our uh, certificates, and that there's, there's so much more room to enhance and add to our education and the importance of doing so. When we think of the appraisal process as we're first taught you know, you, you you think of the appraisal as something that goes on in the background. And as, as counselors, that's really what we are initially taught to teach. But over the years, I think there's really opportunity, you know, if you're particularly newer in the counseling world, or even if you've been doing this for a few years, there's real opportunity to, to go a step further, similar to how in a home buyer education, you would ask, or you would go over questions you'd ask your real estate agent. Um, questions you would ask regarding your appraisal are absolutely things that should be incorporated into that education. So if you're not already, um, there's just so much opportunity. And, and even if someone who goes on to buy a home, um, you know, we're talking about generational wealth, if and when that homeowner decides to sell or move on from this property, just informing the, the, the home buyer of this information is going to be critical down the road. So bringing awareness, you know, um, for what would eventually be hopefully the, the best opportunity to, to build and, and transfer that generational wealth. Um, so if I, I would strongly encourage um, if you're uh, teaching home buyer education to incorporate this into your, your class, uh, including slides specific to the appraisal process, things like questions to ask the lender, questions to ask the realtor, steps that go beyond just it being accepted or being undervalued or um, take this as an opportunity to really expand on that. Thank you, Michael. And as Michael stated, an appraisal is a crucial part of the home buying, home selling journey that happens relatively quickly and can often be overlooked. So we know that communities in which we serve are disproportionately undervalued and impacted by appraisal bias. So we developed an appraisal resource guide for both consumers and housing counselors entitled Navigating the Appraisal Process, in which we educate people about the appraisal process, how to best prepare, and what to do if you receive a low, value, a low valuation. So we have retooled this guide to deliver webinars and in-person presentations in tandem with both realtors and appraisers to a multitude of audiences in Illinois and integrated within our own, our own home buying education at NHS to ensure that people receive an accurate fair valuation on their home. So the genesis of this guide came through debunking and addressing certain myths within the appraisal process. One being you cannot talk to your lender or a realtor about the appraisal process. So we know that this is false. People are able to work with their lender to ensure that they have an appraiser who knows their neighborhood and community. We teach people how to research your appraiser, to find how local their office is and assess their competency working within neighborhoods of color. 
Tools such as HUD's appraiser directory allows you to look up the name of the appraiser to find their credentials, their status, years active, or if that appraiser has an infraction. And if you find that the appraiser is not knowledgeable about the home or your neighborhood, you are able to request, request that your lender assigns you a new appraiser who has demonstrated familiarity with the area where the home is located. We also show people how to work with their realtor to produce what is called an appraisal package to get to their appraiser prior to the appointment. So this packet contains information on the home and neighborhood market analysis, as well as a list of comparable homes um, for the appraiser to get to a determination of value. And for housing counselors, they can help their clients by putting together an informational packet on their home to give to the appraiser that lists um, certain improvements that were made on the home over the last 15 years, any upgrades or renovations, and any designations of historical value of the home in writing that can have an influence on the appraisal value. The next myth, homeowners cannot find their own comparable homes. This is false. There are tools available to help someone know the value of their home prior to when the appraisal is ordered. So if someone is working alone or with a counselor, sites like Zillow or Redfin can give you a sense of the local market. And if someone is working with their real estate agent, that representative can use multiple listing services to help that individual find comparable homes. So we show consumers and counselors how to use online services to find comparables. The best comparables to select will be homes that are similar in size and style of the subject property, the same age of that home, preferably within one mile and preferably sold within the last three to six months. Next slide, please. The third myth, you are not able to request a reconsideration of value. So home buyers and homeowners who we have spoken to have had no idea that there is even a process to appeal their appraisal report. Every institution has their own unique way of going about this process, and there is no standardized approach. However, it is required that a lender produces a clear and consistent method to seek a reconsideration of value. And as a counselor, if your client has an issue with their appraisal, it is important to inquire if their lender provided a way to seek a reconsideration of value. So we partner with an appraiser who walks people through how to read their appraisal report and how to find evidence to support their case. Next slide, please. So the most common errors and inaccuracies that can influence the value are the, having incorrect square footage within the report, um, the incorrect number of bedrooms and baths, not including certain upgrades, features, or renovations, using comparable, dis comparable homes dissimilar to the subject property. So using comparables that are far in proximity to the subject property is a sign that there could be bias within that report. Implicit bias can also show up in the language that is used throughout the report as well. So such language as the black race population is above state average, um, the, the area is predominantly Hispanic, there's more um, racial influence as of late homogeneous neighborhoods with good or bad schools, as well as the subject property being close in proximity to group homes, such as a senior home, can all, can all highlight the adverse conditions and presumptions that the demand is low within a certain neighborhood, which negatively impacts the appraisal value. So we have been engaged in addressing housing disparities and inequities rooted in appraisals for nearly two years now at NHS. This came to our attention through our lending work. Um, we are a community development financial institution and the borrowers we were working with were having trouble closing on their homes because their appraisals were coming in so low. And data shows that in Chicago, about 120 out of every 1,000 homes sold in mostly Black neighborhoods were found to be underappraised compared to approximately 102 in mostly Latino or Hispanic neighborhoods. We found if we continued working with other appraisal management companies or appraisers outside of our network, we would continue to run into this issue. And other CDFIs within our network were also encountering the same issues helping black and brown families buy their homes, coming across the same issues with the appraisal process, and those homeowners were not able to ac access the equity within their homes. So in our lending operations, we created a list of appraisers 
who are competent and have expertise within our neighborhoods and service areas that look like the community in which we serve. So this is just some of the ways in which we are combating appraisal bias on the front end within our home buyer educational and counseling, as well as expanding um, our outreach with, with our appraisal bias workshops and in-person presentations. And Karen, I'm going to invite you to uh, come on camera. Did you have specific questions for Fallon and, and Michael? Yeah, I just want to thank Fallon and Michael for that very, uh, very informative information. And yes, just a follow up question. How often are you all holding the workshops and, and what marketing or outreach do you do to ensure that they are well attended? Yes, yeah, so we put on these um, workshops in person presentations at least twice a quarter. Um, at NHS, we convene a, a, house, a housing policy task force that consists of 20 housing advocacy groups, CDFIs, community development corporations, community groups, and HUD certified housing counseling agencies. And we use this network to market our workshops and webinars and partner with these groups to deliver presentations to their own clients and members. Okay, great. Thank you for that. We appreciate it. And so next, uh, Julia Howard Gordon is here from Fair Housing Advocates of Northern California to give us an overview of some of the work she and her agency is, are engaged in on appraisal bias. Uh, Julia? Hi, I'm Julia Howard Gibbon, and I am the supervising attorney at Fair Housing Advocates of Northern California, which is also known as FANCY. Um, so FANCY is funded in part by the Fair Housing Initiatives Program, which was mentioned earlier, which is also known as FIP. Uh, we also receive funding from the HUD HC program, so we're both a FIP and a housing counseling agency. Um, so for those of you who don't know, FIPs are nonprofit organizations that basically do fair housing work, including counseling renters and homeowners who experience discrimination in housing. So we advocate for clients by representing them in discrimination complaints and lawsuits sometimes. And we do informal interventions as well, like writing letters to landlords or other housing providers on behalf of our clients. Um, another important part of the work that we do is investigating discrimination, which is often done through what's called testing. The most common form of testing is what some people call match pair testing, but there are many, many um, other ways to do it as well. So an example of match pair testing would be if a client came to us and said, I applied to rent a house, but I think my application was denied because I'm black or I'm pregnant or I have a disability or some other protected class. So in the case of race discrimination, we would send two testers that our organization has trained, one black and one white, to go to the property posing as interested renters and then see if the testers are treated differently from each other based on their race. So uh, we've been able to do a form of this type of testing in the appraisal context as well. It's a little bit different with appraisals, but one way to do it is to do what people call whitewashing the home between appraisals to see if the valuation goes up. So um, in one of our cases, which was featured in the last webinar and has also been referenced earlier in the webinar, the case of the Austins in California, um, they basically, they ha had an appraisal come in very low, much lower than they expected. And so they requested that their lender send out another appraiser. And before the second inspection, uh, they took down all their family photos and art, and they had a white friend meet with the appraiser pretending to be the homeowner. And then after that second inspection, the house appraised at a much higher value, suggesting that the race of the homeowner may have influenced the appraisal. Um, so you can do this in a more systemic way as well, which our agency is also currently doing. For example, you can have multiple appraisers appraise the same property, but have half of them meet with a black tester posing as the homeowner and have half of them meet with a, with a white tester posing as the homeowner and then see if the values come in differently. So that's some of the ways that we're doing investigations. Um, thanks. <laughs> so what does appraisal bias look like? Um, I wanted to talk about some of the ways we see appraisal bias play out. While testing is a very important tool, it's not the only way to find evidence in discri of discrimination, especially in appraisal bias cases. So we're currently representing a number of clients in, um, in these types of cases in Northern California. And I wanted to talk briefly about a couple of those cases and some of the evidence that we looked at to determine whether we thought bias may have been an issue in their cases. Uh, so next slide. So here you can see our clients, Ron and Dominique. 
Um, that's them there in the middle with their daughter. Ron is black and Dominique is a Latina. And then the house in this photo was a house that they owned in Oakland, California when they decided to refinance in 2020. Uh, so they applied for a refi loan, but the loan was denied because the appraisal came in too low and much, much lower than a previous appraisal that they had received months earlier. Because uh, they're both real estate professionals, actually Dominique is an appraiser herself, they noticed a lot of issues with the appraisal. Um, and so they sent a lender, they sent a 60 page rebuttal to the lender of the appraisal. Um, and they also requested a reconsideration of value and suggested some alternative comparable sales, which I'm going to use comps as a shorthand, uh, which Fallon and some of the other speakers have, have talked about. So the ROV or the reconsideration of value got sent to the appraiser. But when um, the amended appraisal came back. So basically, when a, when a borrower requests a reconsideration of value, the lender essentially tells the appraiser, you know, the borrower thinks there are either issues or errors with the report, or they think that these other comparable sales would have been more appropriate. And then the appraiser has the opportunity to review their own report and either make changes as necessary or send it back as is and explain why they didn't make any changes. And in this case, they didn't make any changes. Um, so because of that, the lender said, sorry, they were, uh, they were unwilling to send out another appraiser and they said, sorry, your appraisal came in too low. So they were unable to refinance and lower their monthly mortgage payments. And unfortunately, in this case, that difference in monthly mortgage payments, um, was enough to make them, you know, to force them essentially to sell their house. They decided that it was not feasible for them to keep their mortgage. Um, and so they moved into a rental and effectively whitewashed their house when they staged it for sale. They removed all their belongings, all of their photos, you know, put in, you know, quote unquote, neutral furnishings. And then after doing that, the house sold for significantly more than it had appraised for. Uh, so after that, they contacted our agency for help in filing a complaint or a lawsuit against the appraiser and the lender. And so uh, some attorneys and housing counselors in my office investigated their case. Um, next slide, please. So the first thing that we looked at when we investigated their case or when we investigate any of these cases is the location of the comps chosen by the appraiser. So this is actually um, a, some graphics that I created for a different case, but I wanted to show them because I think they're a good visual representation of where we usually start when looking at these cases. So I would never expect um, a housing counselor to, to make sort of one of these maps, but I think it's it's a good um, it's a good graphic because you can see on the left hand side is a color coded census map um, and the color coding represents the percentage of black residents in each census tract and then so the deeper the orange color the higher percentage of black residents. And then each of the little markers represents one of the comparable sales chosen and then the yellow the, the blue and green markers and then the yellow marker at the top is is the um, subject property is our clients home and then. The graphic on the right, a map on the right, shows the location of the comps chosen, and that circle there um, is a one-mile radius around the client's home. So you can see all the other markers are the comps chosen, and you can see that many of them were well outside of that one-mile radius. Um, you can also see that you know the fact that those neighborhoods where those comps are located are quite far means that they're there's a good chance that those neighborhoods might be quite different than your clients' neighborhoods. That's not going to be true in every area, but it was true here in Oakland. So you can see um, what's interesting about this map too, uh, well both, but on the right you can see that rather than choosing um, comparable sales from, you know, a radius around the subject property, you know, choosing some from the north, some from the south, some from the east, some from the west, he went directly south only um, and didn't choose any from neighborhoods to the east or north, which are significantly whiter neighborhoods. And also, I have another graphic, which I didn't include, but if you overlay sort of an old redlining map of Oakland, you'll see that essentially the racial demographics map pretty perfectly right onto this census map on the left. And uh, so it's clear that the appraiser was basically um, staying sort of within the historical confines of, of redlining and, um, and racial composition of neighborhoods. Okay, next slide. So here I wanted to highlight the next thing that we did is we actually sort of Google Maps the neighborhoods in which the comps were located. 
Um, so in addition to looking at the location of the comps in terms of how far or close they are from the client's home, we also looked at the differences themselves of the neighborhoods themselves. So on the left, you can see photos of our client's neighborhood. That was their home in the middle there. Um, and then on the right, you can see photos of the neighborhood where one of the comps at, that the appraiser used was located. So while both of the neighborhoods are histor historically Black neighborhoods and have similar racial compositions, you can see that they're actually very different from each other in other ways. So you can see our client's neighborhood is mostly single family homes and duplexes with neighborhood schools and shops and cafes, while this other neighborhood, which is more than two miles away from our client's home, is mostly made up of warehouses and like industrial properties, has boarded up properties. Uh, right across the street from the comp that the appraiser chose, it was a big, huge empty lot in front of a massive freeway. There's also boarded up homes, illegal dumping, graffiti, and abandoned cars everywhere. So the fact that he chose a comp from this neighborhood told us that on some level, the appraiser probably believed that the racial composition of the neighborhood mattered because otherwise he wouldn't have described this neighborhood and our client's neighborhood as marketably similar. In this case, it seemed like the only real similarity was their racial compositions and, and nothing else, honestly. Um, okay, next slide. So another thing that we looked at is how the appraiser made adjustments for comparable sales. This has been mentioned um, in previous uh, presentations as well. So in Ron and Dominique's case, the appraiser didn't make any adjustments to account for differences in neighborhoods. He said all of the neighborhoods were marketably similar, except for one. He pulled one comp in a neighborhood in a, in a much wider neighborhood. And in that case, he made an um, he did make an adjustment saying that, you know, homes in that neighborhood are more valuable, essentially. Um, but interestingly, he didn't make any adjustments to account for the fact that, that the house itself was much smaller than our client's house and was much less updated. So we pulled the Zillow or Redfin listings, I think, um, for each of the houses. And on the left, you can see our clients, the interior of our client's home. And on the right, you can see the interior of the comp that he used. And you can see that our client's home was much more updated, but he didn't make any adjustments to account for that. So uh, next slide, please. <laughs> so what should you do if you suspect appraisal bias? Um, if one of your clients comes to you and says they suspect their appraisal came in low because of race or some other protected class. Um, you know, I, we don't expect that housing counselors are gonna be able to investigate their case to this level, but I think that there are a lot of things that you can do that Fallon um, talked about in the previous uh, presentation and some of the, you know, and, and look for some of the things that some of the other presenters have uh, looked for as well. You know, you should ask some follow-up questions like, you know, were you home at the time of the inspection or who in your family did the inspector, did the appraiser meet with, you know, um, did, you know, if you can get your hands on the appraisal itself, take a look and see if there were any comments made about neighborhoods, uh, if there were any errors in the size of the appraisal, in the size of the home or the, you know, uh, if the comps just don't seem reasonable for whatever reason, those are some things that you can do preliminarily, but you can also, um, refer your client to a FIP agency. So I didn't show you these slides because what we, you know, I would expect that housing counselors are going to be able to do the same level of investigation that a FIP can do. But you can always find your local FIP and refer clients to your local FIP. Or if you have fair housing counselors in your organization, you know, refer them to them and work together with them to see if potentially um, they can help your client e either determine whether or not it would be you know, whether there is evidence of some kind of bias here, and if so, what to do next, like file a complaint with HUD or your local FIP organi FAP organization or, um, or, or even file a lawsuit. So um, in Ron and Dominique's case, they took a number of, of, they took on a number of strategies, including calling us, but they did some other things as well. So first they submitted the ROV to the lender. Um, in their case, the ROV wasn't successful, but it was an important first step because it put the lender on notice that there was a problem. They also filed a complaint with the California Bureau of Real Estate Appraisers, or BREA, which is the agency in California that regulates um, appraisers. And that investigation took a long time, but in the end, they the BREA actually found a bunch of problems with the appraisal report and issued fines against the appraiser for a number of things, including fabricating information on his appraisal report. So even though that organization isn't designed to look for discrimination, they were able to find a lot of issues with the report that we were able to use as evidence. Um, Ron and Dominique also went to the media. So in an early news story that they did with ABC7, 
That news story actually led to the lender reaching out to them and offering to send out a new appraiser. At that point, it was too late. They had already decided that they had to sell the house and they had already moved out. But sometimes the media could be a useful strategy to get the lender to listen to you. And uh, also, there's, you know, going to the media has helped uh, in sharing their story has helped shed light on this issue. Um, but yeah, the strategy I wanted to make sure that you guys, you know, that housing counselors know about is that they can always contact their local FIP. Um, Ron and Dominique contacted Fancy and we investigated their case, as I showed you, and we helped them file a complaint with the California Civil Rights Department. And then we're right now in the process of potentially filing a lawsuit on their behalf in federal court. So if your clients suspect appraisal bias, there are definitely things that they can do even if some of the earlier strategies don't work, like asking the lender to send out a new appraisal appraiser or you know, asking for a reconsideration of value. Okay, next slide. Um, so this is just uh, our, our contact information. We only take cases in a handful of Bay Area counties, but um, I wanted to include this in case anyone had any questions or they were uh, within our service area. And that's all. Thanks, uh, Julia, I really appreciate that. Uh, great information. Um, just a question. You talked a, a bit, a, a lot about the sort of the reconsideration of value process, some options potentially available to uh, a homeowner in particular, if um, the lender didn't um, approve a reconsideration of value. But in those cases where uh, the lender does uh, accept a reconsideration of value of request, what would be the next steps uh, in that process? So if the lender is willing to accept the reconsideration of value, which they, which they should do, right? They, the, the law provides for that. Um, then, like I mentioned, basically that reconsideration of value request essentially gets sent usually to an appraisal management company, which is the sort of intermediary between the appraiser and the lender, but sometimes it goes directly to the lend to the appraiser. And then the appraiser has the option to decide whether or not they want to make any changes to their appraisal report. Um, often, like I said, the recons and then they send it back to the lender and the lender sends it back to the homeowner. And then that can, if if the appraiser decides not to make any changes, if they say, sorry, you know, you've pointed out some errors here. You say your house is this many square feet, but I think it's this many square feet. Um, or uh, yeah, I took a look at the comps that you suggested and I don't, I don't think they're appropriate for X, Y, Z reasons. Then the lender then has the they basically have the decision as to whether or not they're going to send out a new appraiser or just accept that appraisal as is. And if they accept that appraisal as is, then most likely what's going to happen is either the loan is going to be denied or the or the borrower is going to be offered a loan at inferior terms, right? And so I think sometimes what usually what happens is the lender then tells the 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 home buyer, sorry, the the borrower, so it can be a home buyer or a um, homeowner, um, just wait three months and apply again, which they can do with that same lender or a different lender, and then another appraiser will, appraiser will come out. And I think often people don't realize that they have other recourse besides just waiting. They can actually sue the appraiser or the, or the lender or both for appraisal bias if they really think that there was bias in their case and the lender um, didn't do enough to stop it, basically. So that's where we come in. We want to make sure that people know that, you know, this is a systemic problem, but there's also that there, there are also in, there's individual recourse if you need to, um, if you need to go, you know, if you need to take the next step, if all of the earlier steps that we mentioned don't don't result in anything. OK, great. That's that's very helpful. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. My pleasure. And so now uh, Ayako is uh, joining us again to share more of her expertise as an appraiser and provide an overview of her work and experiences. So Ayako, I'll turn it to you. Okay, thank you again, Karen. Okay, so we um, I discussed the infographic earlier and highlighted some of the, the portions of the appraisal report that may be subjective. Um, I wanted to also mention um, another item from the Freddie Mac study. Um, uh, Julia was just speaking about the range of search for comparables. And yes, it is true, depending on the neighborhood, that could be a good thing that it's extended, 
or, you know, or a bad thing if it's restricted. But one of the things that the Freddie Mac study did find is that for black and brown neighborhoods, that the search parameters for comparables was less than one mile. And in white neighborhoods, it was greater than one mile. And so that's another uh, difference that we're, we're seeing that needs to be taken, you know, a deeper look at. And I also wanted to talk about um, particular biases. We've been talking a lot about appraisal bias. There are hundreds of, of biases in existence. And I wanted to delve a little deeper into a few. And what I kind of view as the ones that are really uh, creating the issue, creating the atmosphere for appraisal bias. So the first one is similarity or affinity. There is a lack of diversity um, in the appraisal field. Uh, the typical profile is a 50 to 60 year old white male. And so the similarity and affinity bias is the sameness or the feeling of comfort with someone that looks and talks like you. So that appraiser may assume or give benefit of a doubt regarding the recent updates that a homeowner provides um, and they believe the one that looks and talks like them over the homeowner that does not. So that is uh, that kind of permeates through the appraisal industry in other ways with the lack of diversity and with trainees trying to find a supervisor, they're having a difficult time if they're a black or brown trainee. So the, the next bias I wanted to discuss is confirmation. And confirmation bias is a tendency to search for and favor and interpret information that confirms or supports one's belief or values. So that appraiser, based on their prior experience or assignments in a particular neighborhood, they kind of have a formed a opinion or a preconceived notion of what the probable value range will be, and they seek data to confirm that existing belief. So that's another example of bias. And when we're talking about bias education, appraisal bias education, especially for appraisers, it really needs to include real world examples that we can kind of see what it looks like, what it, what it feels like, what's a true example in our appraisal practice. So next I wanna talk about real estate agents and housing counselor agencies and what you can do to support appraisers, homeowners, and home buyers. So as Fallon mentioned earlier, the appraiser package um, is a really good tool to inform the appraiser about any comparable sales. And um, one other item that's missed a lot is a list of updates. And it could be updates, it could be renovations, but if you just have a new roof put on or new windows, especially if you updated your kitchen or bathroom, list those and give an approximate date. So it's kind of given a, a range of when those updates were completed. And when you're preparing a reconsideration of value for an appraisal, submit items that are incorrect or missing in the report and provide relevant sales. And I think another way is also to hold interest meetings for appraiser training programs and community outreach meetings like meet the appraiser like um, uh, Melody was speaking about earlier. Let's make you know the appraiser you know part of the community and really speaking and answering those questions you know like we're doing here um, today. Now for the homeowners. Um, providing appraisal education programs on how to prepare for an appraisal how to read or interpret an appraisal report and preparing a reconsideration of value. And then the next area would be for home buyers. So work with your home buyers to provide comparable sales and also assist them in preparing any type of reconsideration value request and understanding different appraisal concepts such as above grade versus below grade level and cost doesn't necessarily equate, equate to value. Now we've talked a lot about the issue and let's talk spend some time talking about solutions. So there are several solutions um, that the Appraisal Institute, they have several programs and initiatives that they are on the books or that are active right now. So we talk about the lack of diversity, um, less than 2% of black appraisers, um, less, less than 2% of all appraisers are black. And as a black woman appraiser, I represent less than 0.70% of all appraisers. 
So one of the initiatives that is happening now is the Appraiser Diversity Initiative. It's a collaboration with the Appraisal Institute, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and the Urban League. And it is a program to attract more diverse trainees through the industry, and it offers scholarships to cover trainee courses. Another program, and that's dealing with education. For the experience, each trainee has to have experience in order to become licensed. And one of the barriers to entry is a trainee trying to find a supervisory appraiser. So a solution to that is PERIA. And PERIA is a practical applications of real estate appraisal. It's an online real world simulation to address training experience hours and the difficulty of that of lack of, of brown and black trainees to locate, locate a supervisory appraiser. The Appraisal Institute version of PERIA is slated to be released um, by the summer. And one of the programs that's really dear to my heart that I really am excited about is the HBCU Outreach. It's a pilot program targeting Atlanta University Center, and that will include Spelman College, Morehouse College, and Clark Atlanta University to establish a real estate appraisal program. Now, other areas and solutions for appraisal bias, um, we can model the NHS program, NHS program in Chicago, where you partner with a lending organization to provide in-house lending and panel of approved appraisers that have bias training. And then finally, we have to really empower ourselves and start interviewing our lender and asking before we even submit an application, what is your reconsideration of value process? and really push for conventional lenders to adopt the proposed changes similar to what FHA is doing regarding a standard procedure for responding to appraisal appeals and reconsideration of values that are fair and equitable. So that's, um, that's my presentation on um, appraisal bias and solutions. Great, thank you, Ayako. Uh, it's really insightful to get insights on this topic directly from an appraiser. So thank you for all of that. Uh, and so Tierra, I'm sending it back to you. I believe we have another Mentimeter poll. We sure do. Let me get it uh, ready for us. And in order to get to uh, the poll, you'll wanna click on the link uh, that William entered into the chat box to go directly to the poll. You can also go to www.menti.com and type in the code that you see on the screen. So our last question, after hearing today's presentations, do you feel better prepared to identify appraisal bias? Are you more prepared to discuss it with your clients and others? Are you, you know, taking the information in and recognizing that there's a need to educate on appraisal bias and, and implement education into your own home ownership education programs? And, and or do you feel like you need to learn more about appraisal bias? So let's see what folks are saying. Um, we have a lot of folks uh, feeling like they, they want to implement and they recognize, recognize the need to educate on appraisal bias within their own home ownership education programs. Folks feel better prepared to identify it. Um, and so this looks really good. So that means you learned something from today and that's our goal for today. Um, folks feel more prepared, better prepared. They recognize the importance. And then of course, we, we still need to learn more. We can always learn more. So thank you for participating in the poll. And now I am going to turn it back over to Karen to answer a few questions. Yes, thanks, Tiara. Um, so I'd like to invite uh, Fallon, Michael, Julia, and Ayako to join us on camera again to answer some of the questions we've received in the Q&A box. We have a few of them that are uh, that I'd like to pose. And this one, this first one, um, We'll start with Fallon, but uh, Julia, you and Ayako may have some thoughts around this. Uh, and this is related to inaccuracies uh, and bias in appraisal. Fallon, in your presentation, you and Michael's presentations, you talked about inaccuracies in appraisals. Has there ever been any language around crime rates that you've seen uh, in appraisals, uh, been part of? Uh, the appraisal report or part of the conversation that might indicate that bias is occurring. 
crime rates. Any mention of that that you've seen? Balance? So working with our clients, we actually haven't received anything around crime rates. I can see exactly how that would play and influence appraisal, um, the appraisal value. Uh, most of the common accuracy that we see is around not including the recent home improvements or using comparables that are outdated or dissimilar in character to the subject property. But um, yeah, we haven't received anything that speaks directly towards crime rates, but I can definitely see how an appraiser can point to the, the crime rate that's within a certain neighborhood and use that as um, a factor that influences the value of the home. Okay, okay. Julia or Ayako, any comment on I that? Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. We haven't seen any appraisals where the appraiser mentions crime rates in the appraisal report itself, but we have had a few cases that are similar to the one that I spoke on. So like Ayaku said, sometimes it's more appropriate to pull comps that are closer to the property rather than to venture out. And sometimes it's more appropriate to venture out if you can't get any properties close by that make any sense. And we've made both of those arguments. Um, but one thing that we have seen that's come up is where the, similar to what I spoke about, where is, um, where the only similarities between the neighborhoods where our client's home is located and where the comps are located is the racial composition, but there are vastly different, there are huge differences in other areas, including quality, you know, ratings of schools or crime rates. So in the case where I showed that, um, you know, that there was like our client's neighborhood is a bunch of, you know, single is zone for single family homes. And then it was one of the comps was in a neighborhood that was full of industrial warehouses and things. The crime rates in that neighborhood were significantly higher as well. And so we also pointed that out in our, um, in our brief. Okay. Okay. Uh, Yako, any uh, references you've seen at all to crime rates that might be uh, yes. indicate bias? Yeah, that's typically um, not included in any appraisal reports um, th that I've seen uh, recently. But I will say around the time of, of, you know, redlining and when you're talking about demographics, you know, which was not too long ago, there would be more about the demographic profile, about the racial composition, you know, of the neighborhood that was discussed in appraisals. But it doesn't happen today. But, you know, we also have to remember that's, you know, that's kind of back there. And if you have an appraisal of a certain age that's training the next generation, those views can still be passed on to the next generation. Okay. Yeah. And I would say if, if you see a comment about crime in an appraisal report, I would definitely flag that as a potential sort of dog whistle as well, because that that could have you know, that could be, have some, hold some implicit bias in the common itself in the way that the appraiser is thinking about a particular neighborhood in terms of race. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you for that. And so here's an interesting one. And uh, Yako, I'll start this one with you. Um, the question is uh, appraisals below contract price in white neighborhoods. Uh, this person is wondering if there is a difference in appraisals when the couple are in a multiracial relationship or if there are same sex relationships? Have you seen any bias in those types of scenarios? Yes, I was looking for the, the link. Um, Larry Miller with WSA9 in, in, in DC, he did a recent news report on a same sex couple. And I wanna say it was in Oregon. Um, so that they, they did show bias, the appraiser actually um, had commented on a photo or something about, I don't agree with same-sex marriage. And they ended up getting um, a low appraisal and they did file a claim for appraisal bias. Um, now, regards to interracial couples, um, I don't know of any studies that are studying that beyond, you know, um, what like Julia organization is doing where you have the black, you know, the black um, spouse one day and then the next one appointment and then the white spouse the next, the different appointment, uh, but not an interracial couple. I don't know of any cases or any studies that has studied that uh, so far. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm not aware of any research on it, but we we definitely we got a complaint from a couple. Um, where the husband was white and the wife was black and the and the husband, the white husband met with the appraiser both times, except for before the second appraisal. So 
when the first appraiser came, he saw families, he saw photos of a multiracial family up in the home. And then when the second appraiser came, they took down all their family photos and the appraisal did come and hire the second time. So I don't know if it, you know, we don't, we can't isolate the bias there to say that it has to do with the fact that the couple was multiracial or that, you know, that the, that the husband was white and that the wife was black or that the, any black people lived in the home or what, but we, we have gotten a report of a case like that. Okay. Okay. And Julia, I'm going to ask this question of you also, since you talked a lot about reconsideration of value. Uh, the question is, if the request for reconsideration of value is denied, but the lender agrees to a second appraiser, is that an expense that the home, the home buyer or the homeowner has to pick up? It really depends. It depends on the lender. So we've seen some lenders say, you can have another appraiser come if you pay for the appraiser. And then we've had other lenders say, you know, we think you're right. This appraisal should be thrown out. We're going to go ahead and pay for another appraisal. And in, you know, our argument would be that the lender has a responsibility to, they can't make underwriting decisions based on a racially biased appraisal or a biased appraisal, right? Because of the Fair Housing Act. And so if they um, determine, which they're supposed to do, that an appraisal is biased, then they really should be paying for the new appraisal. But we have seen it. Um, but it, 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 it's possible that they just think the appraisal, you know, that they're just trying to help the homeowner out, but they don't actually think the appraisal is biased or, you know, different lenders have different policies. But if they're making the appraiser, the, the homeowner pay for the second appraisal, and the homeowner has some evidence that that first appraisal was biased, I think that that would be evidence that the lender, you know, also engaged in housing discrimination as well. Okay, great, great, great. Um, so Fallon and Michael, let's, let's come back to you just for a second. Um, in your list of inaccuracies, um, what would you say is the most common inaccuracy you see in appraisal reports? Yes, so we are part of our work is also collecting um, appraisal complaints and interviewing homeowners, home buyers who have gone through the appraisal process and and have um, experienced bias, bias or discrimination. Um, and when we look at their appraisal report, some of the most common inaccuracies within the report that we see is either implicit or explicit bias um, is the appraiser using comparables that are outside of the Cedric properties area. So in neighborhoods that are farther away, um, so not close in proximity at all. Also um, omitting certain features and new um, renovations or upgrades that were made to the home. Also um, having incorrect square footage. Those are all some of the most common things that we see within the appraisal report. Okay, thanks for that, uh, Fallon. And we have time for one more question. Uh, this one for you. Ayako, um, why aren't there more black and brown appraisers? Yeah, I think it's um, lack of, of, of access and really knowing about the industry. I kind of found out about it through a college um, internship program. Uh, my father is a contractor, so it was in the same arena, but that's when I found out about it. But it actually, it took me years to decide that I wanted it for a career. Um, but I think it's really lack of access because when we're doing the university um, relations outreach, we're finding that a lot of students don't even know about the uh, the industry and about the position of an, of an appraiser. It's only coming out more because of all the discussion about appraisal bias. But I think it's just really lack of access. So I think outreach meetings and you know discussing the industry, the appraisal diversity initiative, as well as like meet the appraiser, those type of events really do introduce young people to the career. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks for that, and and thank you to all our presenters presenters today, uh, including Jerry Mayer and Melody Taylor from HUD. We hope this has been informative and that the information shared will be useful in supporting your clients and others who might benefit from it. So with that, Tiara, I'll turn it back over to you. Yes, so uh, on behalf of HUD and 
the Office of F FHEO, Office of Housing Counseling. We want to thank you. We also wanted to share some additional resources. There will be an additional session, the third session to the Combating Appraisal Bias Series, which will actually be a National Fair Housing Training Academy forum titled Building Fair Housing Partnerships. So you learned all about uh, how uh, appraisal bias impacts communities of color. And then in this, this session, you learn more about what housing counselors need to know, how to identify it, um, what it looks like. And then in this third session, with your, your the industry um, and all, all the other fair housing partners to come back. Come back. We uh, enter the link into the chat. You can register there. We have also have links to uh, finding FIP grantees and FAP grantees. So Julia mentioned that she, uh, that FANCY is a FIP grantee. And so if you want to locate the FIP or FAP grantees within your community, you can use the links here to, to locate the, uh, the FIP and FAP organizations. You can also find uh, a housing counselor uh, using the link that we included in the resources, as well as more information um, on behalf of uh, the Office of Housing Counseling. Uh, we also entered, uh, provided the the link to NHS is navigating the appraisal process guide, which may be very a very helpful resource for you um, if you're a housing counseling agency as well. And I believe those are all the resources. And once again, on behalf of the Office of Housing Counseling and Office of uh, Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity, I'd like to thank you uh, for joining us today and hope to see you next time. Thank you.